It's all yours, Mark. Hi, everyone. Uh, hello, everyone. Obviously, my name is Mark. I'm the uh, Vice President and Education Officer. Uh, firstly, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land in which we meet today, and I'd also like to pay my respects to Elders past and present. Uh, today, we've got Mr. Mark Roberts, who's a technical consultant with Invista Forensics down in Melbourne. Uh, he investigates electrical, electronic, you know, electric mechanical failures uh, through a wide, wide range of insurance related matters. He's going to be talking uh, to us today about 12 volt systems in vehicles and and etc. So I'll uh, hand it over to Mark and he can take over. Thanks. Yeah, really. Hello, everyone. Um, I'll just, um, I'll, what I'll do is I'll start up my presentation real quick and then we can have a little, little introduction. Okay, perfect. There we go. Great. So can everyone, uh, everyone see the presentation okay? Yep. No, it's not. Oh. It's fine. Sorry? Yeah, yeah, I, I can see it. Bobby, you can't see it. Just let me uh, change my screen. Ah, uh, yeah, I've just got to <laughs> move everybody over. Oh, right, now I can see it. Thank you. Great, great. So um, welcome, everyone. Um, thank you for being here today um, to listen to my presentation. Just want to give a, a quick introduction here. So I'm, my name is... Uh, Mark Roberts, I work for a company called Envista Forensics. We're a forensic engineering and a consultancy company down here in Melbourne, but also globally based out of the US. So we have multiple locations throughout the world, including Singapore, and we do um, we offer services to mostly to insurance companies, but we have been hired previously in private basis to identify failure of mechanical electrical systems, as well as conduct um, liability um, investigations, as well as fire investigations. Now, myself, I specialize in electrical engineering. So today we were talking to you about 12 volt lead acid batteries and what happens when you abuse um, those batteries and what is the consequence of doing so. Um, it'd be good if I go there. We go. So silly put, we're going to go over a couple of things today. So it's introduction and engineering background about who I am, what I do, um, how I am um, knowledgeable enough to make comment on the things I'm going to show you today. We're going, going to go into battery theory exactly what is a 12-volt battery. We know that batteries go obviously sit in vehicles, are in solar arrays, are in your toys, but what exactly constitutes and uh, makes up in the design of a battery and how exactly that works chemically to provide you with the electricity that you need for all your electrical applications. We're then going to do a quick dive into uh, vehicle battery energy management inside vehicles, so a lot of modern vehicles, how they are regulating 12-volt 12 12-volt power around your car, as well as um, how the charging system works in order to keep that battery topped up. In the end, how a battery should be charged and what you should be recognizing from charging characteristics of those batteries. What happens whenever a total battery does explode and what you should be expecting and what you should be trying to avoid in that situation. And then a little into my own investigation of a total battery explosion I experienced in my previous occupation while working for an automotive manufacturer. How to prevent explosions uh, in total batteries. And we'll do a quick little answer and question at the end. I do ask that if you do have any questions, do please put them in the chat or do you know keep them to the end or during if you'd like, if it is quite important that you want to raise. Um, I do want to get back to everyone. So if you don't want to leave it in the chat, please leave your email as well. So I can always get back to those questions later if we don't address them today. So a little background about who I am. So again, my name is Mark Roberts. I'm a uh, electrical electronics engineer who's had um, who's had a great opportunity to be able to travel the world and see some pretty amazing things. So I'm originally from Australia, um, though my accent may sound a bit different than most others. I've managed to get around to some different places. Um, I grew up here. I then moved over to Texas um, at a young age to complete my high school education. From there, I then went to the, U uh, the UK sorry, and continued my degree in electrical electronics and engineering. From there, I finished up my degree and managed to make my way over to Bentley uh, Motors in the UK, who's a prominent automotive manufacturer, uh, part of the Volkswagen group. I was put in charge of 12 volt and 48 volt battery systems inside vehicles for the entire world. And I was responsible for designing a couple of electric systems and energy management systems in those vehicles between 2018 and 2021. After coming back to Australia um, last year, I managed to get a job with Invista Forensics as a technical consultant in electrical and electronic failures. Uh, but I've been able to do everything in between, to be honest, between mechanical failures and generators, 
as well as a lot of building fire investigation for mechanical side, as well as electrical boards and a couple of vehicle fire investigations myself, which though I'm fairly new to, um, I seem to be picking up quite a few more jobs than I did last year, this year. So let's start with what is a lead acid battery. So a lead acid battery, there's um there's three main types of lead acid batteries that we're going to cover today. That's the AGM battery, the um excuse me, the flooded valve um, regulated battery, as well as a gel battery too. So here we've got a AGM battery. An AGM battery is um a newer battery that's on the market at the moment. It's probably the most recent technology for batteries, lead acid batteries, and that is incorporating a glass sheet fleece to hold the um, what used to be sulfuric acid or um, or another type of, of chemical uh, reactant and reagent inside the batteries that allow for that chemical transfer of molecules between the two plates. So in this case, we've got here the plate set. So if you were to cut open your car battery at the moment, you would see a reference of four plates, or in this case, there's five. You've got a positive grid on the left-hand side here. The positive conductor plate so the grid allows for a better conduction between the entire plate surface instead of just being at one point you allow uh, multiple pickups on that on plate there's then a fleece separator and that fleece separator then holds the electrolyte that allows for the chemical exchange between the two plate types normally the different plates are of different um excuse me metal materials either a lead or some other anode and then you've got a negative grid and then the conductor plate on the other side which then creates one cell. Now from that cell, these tend to be a, a almost a fused element, almost like a jigsaw puzzle, um, a stack, a sandwich, whichever way you want to explain it. But these two plate sets tend to come together and multiple plate sets make up a battery. So in this case, we've got a two volt step, which is those plates bind together, um, again, with the electrolyte in between, and that makes a cell. And then obviously a 12 volt battery, you're going to have six of those cells. On top of those cells, um, you're going to have the bus bars. And though we see two posts on the battery, in fact, there are multiple bus bars running the length of a battery on the inside, and those are interconnected, varying in uh, polarity so that you can get a positive and negative side instead of just one long positive bar, one long negative bar. So there's the battery again. So here on the right hand side, um, we've gone in, in more industrial uh, utilization, at least for big heavy plant equipment. Um, AGM batteries have gone from the standard plate type to more of a spiral type, more compact, therefore more robust, um, especially whenever working in heavy mining environments, this need for robust batteries, especially when the machinery is in perpetual motion and is constantly vibrating, being bumped around, being jostled. The ability to have a spiral means that those cells are kept very tight and therefore you can have less damage to the cells. And if there's less damage to the cells, less likely to have a high resistive load inside the cell and less likely for it to either fail or burn down. So why do they use AGM batteries, especially in automotive uh, solutions? It's simply because the wicking techno technology of the glass fiber mat and how that battery can be mounted in various unspecified orientations that aren't gonna cause liquids to pour out or aren't gonna cause any destruction to that battery, but it's gonna hold the um, electrolyte in place. Then also is the extended lifetime of the battery. So it's between five and seven years, as well as the fact that you're going to have a, an ability to do start stop on those batteries more reliably as the cells are denser packed and electrolyte is more evenly distributed across the battery. So the starting and stopping, or at least the discharge current and recharge capabilities of the batteries are more efficient. However, saying so, the cost of that battery is going to increase because of its engineered principle and the design of the battery itself. So we'll then go to a more, what everyone else would know uh, more quickly as a battery um, and as the flooded valve uh, regulated battery. And this is simply a wet cell battery where there is an aqueous solution of sulfuric acid that sits in the bottom of the battery itself. And from there, that, that's going to saturate the plates, but it does often need to be maintained and topped up with water like a lot of the older batteries did. Though very robust system and though capable of running for 10 years, if not more, um, these batteries had to be placed in a stable situation or in a stable location where they can't be tipped or jostled, um, mainly because if that liquid does come up to the top of the cartridge, there is a possibility for it to tip out and pour out, which obviously, one, sulfuric acid everywhere is not a great thing. And two, um, excuse me, uh, 
it, it's going to be more problematic for the battery's um, operating conditions and how it actually needs that solution to be spread across the plates in order to function correctly as a battery. So in this case, you can have voltage sag, you can have um, you can have degradation of cells where a cell may go dry, and then you get sulfation as the ox as the plate itself oxidizes, and you no longer get the transfer of molecules between the plate sets. So though this is a very robust solution, it has been for many many years. A lot of automotive manufacturers and equipment suppliers are moving away from wet batteries, uh, mainly because of the maintenance and having to keep them properly, you know, checked, maintained. It's becoming more hassle to keep on top of, as well as um, the fact that it's just a dying breed. Like most things, we are moving forward into a, a more advanced technological society, and therefore these sort of batteries are being left in the wayside as gel and AGM batteries are becoming more affordable and uh, more mass produced. So we'll just go through what exactly is it, it encompasses a flooded valve regulated battery. So here we got cell vent caps, which also can be used as fill ports for filling up deionized liquid into your battery to keep that solution um, going, the electrolytic solution. The top cover tends to mount directly to the top of the battery, is then sealed on. There's then a 12 volt battery case. This can often be made out of glass fiber reinforced PPE. Um, Oh, excuse me, PA6, or it could be um, just simply polypropylene uh, plastic housing, which is very thin material, but still works as a bucket. From there, we've got the terminal caps and posts. So we talked about the bus bars before. In this situation, we've got one long distended bus bar on either side. And then the electrolytics dilute of sulfuric acid. The fact that obviously, again, when you, when you pair up those cells and plates, you end up with multiple sets of 2.4 volts, which then equals that 12 volt with a nominal capacity of 12.84 volts. Moving on from there again, we got the gel electrode battery. So, so we got we got a nice little medium here. This is this is between your AGM battery, higher end $500 line entry battery to your very cheap $15, $20 flooded battery. Somewhere in between there, you've got the gel, and the gel tends to be used in a lot more, um, more commercial as well as household applications for solar arrays, uh, golf carts in this case, or your kids' toys. A lot of toys will have these 12 volt batteries, 9 volt batteries that are sealed gel. Um, this can also be used in small little starter motors, all types of different things for generators. This is a very common battery that's currently being used and mass produced because of how efficient gel is compared to flooded and the fact that it can be jostled, it can be moved around, tipping, you know, it can be put in different orientations without actually failing. So some of the so some of the advantages here, the maintenance-free aspect, we don't have to add deionized water, you don't have to perpetually make sure that the inside's clean, you don't have to top up anything else. Um, they have a high performance curve, so they're going to perpetually supply a certain current up until about the 40% SOC or SOH mark, and then they die off. So 10 years, 15 years in, you get to a degradation of the cells up to about 40% left of those cells of capability and usage. And from there, they just drop off. So you can have sustained usage of those batteries for a long period of time. Um, there is a high manufacturing cost. However, it's not as high as AGM batteries. And just like the other three batteries, during charging, there is a hydrogen gassing and off gassing, um, which is the process as you are recharging those batteries, the byproduct is hydrogen gas gets created. So there is often vent ports on these um, and there's, they're more than likely built with polypropylene cases instead of glass fiber reinforced because of the mass manufacturing requirements. So let's talk about the vehicle's batteries energy management system. So in your vehicle, when you're driving, we all know that there's an alternator or a generator in your vehicle. Um, and depending on those principles, you can either have a DC out or an AC out um, or an AC DC rectification inside the vehicle. Um, from there, that's normally just pumped straight back to the car or straight back to the battery, depending on the vehicle's orientation and what it is doing and where it's moving. Um, however, as vehicles are getting more and more um, technologically advanced, we're seeing that there is a multitude of different charging strategies going into cars and especially charging 12 volt batteries, especially as we move into electric vehicles. What we're seeing is a use of DC DC charging on 12 volt batteries, but now a shift from lead acid to lithium 12 volt batteries, as well as lithium battery packs inside vehicles. But today we'll cover the general concept of charging strategies in standard ICE vehicles. So 
we understand that the alternator has to spin. And from the spinning, there is a generation of power. And from that generation, it then is fed back to either the consumers of the vehicle or to charge the battery, depending on requirements and the SOC of the battery as well and its demands. So in general concept, upon acceleration, your alternator is going to be working at maximum efficiency because it's spooled up and running at a high speed. So therefore, you're getting maximum generation. The generator of vehicle tends to sit at 13.5 volts. Um, and that is what you would call a supply or a, a, a float charge of the vehicle. And that is supplying all the consumers in the car, but not necessarily charging the battery. So it's simply all it's doing is providing generated electricity to all your electrical consumers. From there, if the battery voltage tends to drop under 80 SOC or 80% state of charge, what you'll have then is, is a kick up or a change up or a signal sent from the vehicle's ECU to the generator to say, hey, look, we're going to need 15 volts so that I not only can supply the electrical consumers in the vehicle, but we can also supply the battery with the charge voltage. During that time, there'll normally be a charge between 60 to 80% into 90% of that battery. And once that battery reaches 90% to 100%, it will tend to switch back to the 13.5. Now this is this can be uh, really nicely seen when you're sitting in your vehicle. So if you're sitting in your vehicle and you see producing power back to the battery and charging, however, you tend to see the RPM drop to about 650 to 600. It's it's possible that you are in a stable state and the generator does not need to charge the battery and everything's being provided by the generator. Now during deceleration, which is quite interesting, we get into re recuperative uh, regeneration of power back to the 12 volt battery. As you start to stop, and this is very prevalent with start stop mechanisms in vehicles these days, as you're slowing down or as you take your foot off the accelerator and you tap the brake, the generator will go into recuperation. And from there, it will start harnessing as much power as it can from the vehicle's momentum and then put that straight back to the 12 volt battery and charge it. And during that time, the 12 volt battery is only supplying the electrical consumers in your vehicle. So a lot of my testing when I was working at Bentley was to take a vehicle out and go do recuperation testing where I would turn on all the electrical loads in the vehicle and we would drive it between, between 50 miles per hour and 70 miles per hour, varying and oscillating the speed up and down perpetually for four hour spans down a motorway. And doing so, we would actually force the generator to provide as much power as it can back to the battery and then allow the battery to discharge into electrical consumers. And what we we're seeing were that as you were perpetually accelerating, decelerating, accelerating, you were actually feeding upwards of 300 amps from the generator back to the battery. So some batteries can't handle that. Like the AGM batteries do have a tolerance to take up to 350 amps, um, depending on the capacity. But uh, what we found was that during recuperation, um, it is possible to have your battery charge very quickly and under high current. So. If you do find yourself that your battery has died and you need to take it for a drive or your battery's been sick for a long period of time, um, I would recommend that you take your vehicle to, to a highway and within your local laws and tolerances, vary your speed up and down 10 kilometers per hour, forcing a generator to bulk charge your battery, um, rejuvenating it, bringing it back into life, um, definitely reducing sulfation, which can happen when a battery is left too long by itself. So in the end, this is the battery that you put in the back of a Bentley. So this is from a GT, um, and it's also fit into the Flying Spur and the Bentayga. So the four-wheel drive, the sport, two-door sports car, as well as the four-door saloon. This is a 105 amp hour battery. That battery then is connected to a BDM, which is a negative post sensor, which then reads the capacity in, capacity out, voltages, temperatures, so on and so forth to regulate recuperation. That is then connected to the W12 engine in the Bentley um, by the generator in the bottom left-hand corner here. And that generator then provides back up to 16 volts back to the battery and supplies the car. And that's all run via something called the gateway computer, which is an ECU that sits somewhere in the vehicle, but it controls absolutely everything to do with the cars. If anyone's worked on Volkswagens or Volkswagen branded vehicles, this is a very um, this is a very uh, known entity inside the vehicles, especially for the functionality. So let's talk about charging characteristics. So we've talked about batteries, we've talked about their construct, we've talked about what happens in a vehicle, but we can't just simply apply current. You can't just take your 12 volt battery, hook it up to a steady state current of six amps and expect it to charge. There are certain cycles and profiles that have to be followed in order to correctly charge a battery. Now, this is often done through solar inverters, 
So when you have a, vin, a, a house with a solar system installed, the solar inverter may have a battery bank and the battery bank will need to be charged in a certain way. And this is the standard industry type of charging stand, uh, charging characteristics that are used. So I won't go too much in detail. I'll be just reading off the slide if I do. But um, this is the type of characteristics that you want to see in charging just standalone 12 volt batteries. So if you take a 12 volt battery out of your RV or your, or your camper or your caravan and you need to charge it before you go out on a big weekend, your charger that you tend to put on that to charge those batteries will be doing this exact cycle. So it will do a, a sudden, sudden surge phase where it's trying to find out exactly what the battery can handle, what it can do. This is like a health check. From there, it will do a stable current push. So it'll do that for a certain amount of time while slowly increasing the voltage just for checking acceptance. And then it'll go through this curve of stabilization, of charging, of bulking, of holding, and then floating. And then right at the end when it's done, it'll just do a, a continuous up and down charging cycle where it just maintains the charge of the battery until you're ready to take it off. Now, you should never leave battery charging too long because you'll have a buildup of um, hydrogen inside the battery, which is obviously, we all know, explosive. So um, definitely if you're charging batteries at home, make sure that not only are they in a well-ventilated area, but also you're not leaving them charging for prolonged periods of time. In the left-hand corner here, I've just left a little level. So especially with a lot of people who work on their vehicles and they want to know, oh, is my battery charged? You know, is it working correctly? This is a good little key um, to use to find out what your battery state of health is or state of charge. Um, and this varies on the age as well. So it's a good thing to keep in mind. So let's talk about what happens when a battery explodes. Um, now, you know, everyone thinks, you know, lithium batteries, lithium batteries explode. And, you know, that's, that's the biggest issue that we have at the moment. However, lead acid batteries are also very susceptible to explosions, um, considering that they do off-gas hydrogen. Um, and that should be kept in mind. So while working at Bentley, I managed to witness one battery explosion in my entire three years at Bentley. And it was a pretty horrific experience. It put someone in hospital. It was a pretty big thing for the company. We ended up making a lot of changes inside the organization after it. But because I was the owner of all 12 volt batteries, it was my responsibility to find out what happened. And I shouldered a lot of the burdens that came about of that very terrible accident. So we got two cars here. We got one on the right here is the Bentayga 4x4. And on the left here is the Flying Spur. Now, this is simply just to build a scene for you that we can talk about what exactly happened in the incident. So in the back of the flying spur is the battery and it's housed below a foot carpet. And in the right hand side here, we've got the Bentayga where the battery is housed below the driver's seat. And that's just in front of where the seat sits. Now, the reason why I'm showing this is because of the installation location. So in a vehicle, we all know that the battery tends to be mounted inside the bonnet of the car. Um, and especially during a fire investigation, it's good to find out exactly where that 12 volt battery is and if it has caused the fire or if there's an electrical failure related to that, which has caused the vehicle to go up in flames. So in this case, take this as, as a learning principle, uh, in Bentleys, if you ever do investigate a fire inside a Bentley, there will be two locations for those batteries, one in the rear for the Flying Spur and the GT Continental and one of the, um, the footwell here for the Bentayga. So we got two batteries here, and you can notice, if you look carefully, you'll notice that on the left-hand side here, we've got a battery with a plastic cover over the top that interacts with the negative side of the battery. And on the right-hand side, we've just got a flat open style battery. There's nothing covering it. You can see all the information you need, and you can see a junction box where the positive side connects. Now, the reason why I'm showing this is because the mounting location and static electricity buildup is a massive problem with 12 volt batteries. Um, the 12 volt battery is a grounded system. Um, it's under high electrical potential all the time. It's constantly being charged. It's technically a bomb in the back of your car. Now, don't be, don't be scared. It's very rare, very, very rare that you have a battery explode. However, in certain situations where the manufacturer or a service technician has not replaced certain electrostatic distribution covers or has not mounted a battery correctly, there can be instances there where ventilation tubes are not connected and you can have hydrogen gas filling an area while the battery is being used, especially on long drives. So before vehicles in Bentley go out to the customer, they sit for a long period of time. And a lot of these vehicles do get shipped overseas. So we're talking 60 days sitting times of vehicles on ships where the 12 volt battery is required to sustain electrical, um, electrical supply to certain ECUs while that vehicle is being moved and and um excuse me shipped to its its end address so the principle is that you charge a battery 
to 70%. And 70% is enough charge to allow the battery to get to the other side fine um, and to the dealership without an issue, without having to be recharged. And 70% means that's not at 100% electrical potential. So if something does happen, it's not going to be a massive problem. So coming off the line, the vehicles are, are cleaned down. They're ready to go before they get onto the transporter. They're taken to a place called PID or pre, uh, excuse me, PDI or pre-dealer inspection. And during the pre-dealer inspection, a lot of the electrical consumers are tested and tried. So that 12 volt battery, because the engine's not running and they're being moved around, um, you're using a lot of the power on the on the battery, or you're using a lot of the capacity, which means that vehicles are leaving the manufacturing line with close to 50% state of charge, which is not ideal, especially if they're going to be sitting for long periods of time out on, on container ships going out to the Middle East or over to Japan or X, Y, and Z. So here's the battery. I got called because one of our cars got to the end of the line and we ended up having this happen. Now, just take a second and, and look at this because there's quite a... For, for the very keen eye of you, you understand what you're seeing here, but for those who don't, this is a 12 volt battery that's had a significant and catastrophic failure in the back of a vehicle, resulting in the injury of an employee. Um, and that came down to multiple factors, but all I was presented on my email box on that Tuesday, I, in, sometime in June, it's frozen cold. It was awful, awful day. Um, and I got sent this and said, you need to go down to the to the manufacturing line immediately. We've had an incident. So what we got here is the plastic housing of the battery, which isn't glass fiber reinforced, has blown out um, multiple pieces. And you can see dark charring on the fleece plates, as this is an AGM battery. It's a large battery. It's a 105 amp hour battery. So it's got 105 amp hours worth of potential that can be expelled at any one point. And there's two carrying handles over the top. So let's get into the investigation side of things. I've shown you a lot about the theory. I've shown you a lot about how it works inside a vehicle. But when it does go wrong, these are the things you need to keep an eye out for. So I was presented with, I managed to get this battery and I managed to bring it back to the office. I managed to take a few pictures, multiple pictures of what had happened here. And in the top left-hand corner here, you can see where the housing is cracked. Um, not only just cracked, but it looks like it's almost pulled itself apart, shattering in this case. Center picture was a picture we saw before. The right-hand side is the stamp date that you find on a lot of Volkswagen product vehicles. Uh, on the battery, you will see a, on the negative post, you'll see a stamp month and year, and that's the manufacturing time of that battery. So it's always good to check that and say, okay, when was this battery built? How long has it been used for? Um, a lot of the times, if you have diagnostics equipment, you can plug into the vehicle and find out how many times it's been charged and discharged. Bottom left-hand corner here, you can see the ventilation tube hole, which have been plugged on the left-hand side. So there has to be one open on the right. If not, we've got a bit of a problem. So the left-hand side here, we've got a plug, a little plastic plug that sits on one side. And then from the other side, there will be a vent tube that should come out and feed out to the open air. Again, on the positive side of the battery here, in the bottom middle, we can see the crack, which is perpetuated from the gas chamber inside. So it looks like there's been a mass of pressure built up on that side as well. Um, and then on the right-hand side here, we can just see more discoloration of that fleece. So I went about looking to see if this was a potential massive problem. Am I going to have multiple vehicles blowing up? We're going to have a huge issue here. And when I asked them to point me in the direction of their batteries, they said, yeah, out the back. So I went out the back, and this is this is what we have. I found out they had been leaving batteries outside um, in the cold, undercover, but not an ideal situation to keep 12 volt batteries, especially when they've just come in from a manufacturer, they haven't been charged, they're probably at 30% SOC themselves and need a good charge, they're just sitting on pallets. So this was already red flag number one. Why, why are we charging batteries? Why are we leaving batteries outside? It turns out these batteries are secondary use batteries and they've come off the line and they were used simply through manufacturing and they've been left here. So what was happening with them afterwards? Well, as soon as the vehicle was coming off the line, that battery that had been used or slaved onto the vehicle to during the build process was being taken off and put on those pallets and put out the back. Those pallets then were being taken into a secondary location recharged 
and put back into vehicles for a final step process where they will replace, they would then go ahead and replace those batteries with brand new batteries. So there's been a mix up somewhere and they were taking brand new batteries, charging them to 100% and then lopping these final batteries into the cars, packing the car up, putting all the white covers on them and then putting them on the transporters. So when I walked in and took a look at their um their final their final end of line checks and their pre dealership inspection situation, I walked into this, which was a vehicle in the center, a pallet of batteries on the right hand side. Bear in mind, stacked oftentimes five high, which already is a big fire hazard. You should never stack twelve volt batteries ever in any sort of indoor environment. And on the left hand side, there was a charger, and the charger was connected to the vehicle. So while they're doing the work, the batteries are being charged inside the vehicle. And if there's no battery in the vehicle, the charger was simply supplying basic electrical consumers inside the car for moving the seats back and forth, operating the windows, radios, you name it. So at the front of the vehicle is the bonnet. And inside the bonnet here, we've got two jump start points, which I used and inherently connected to the 12 volt battery. And from there, the positive and negative are attached, one to chassis, one to the positive fuse box just to supply power. Now these chargers are capable of doing 150 amps, which is more than enough for the vehicle's general consumers. So these were charging all these power in the vehicle for all types of underlying checks. In the boot, we had the battery um, and that battery then was being taken out. And then a brand new freshly charged battery was being put in before it was all being packed up and sent off to the transporter. And these were the pallets that were just being left next to the car. And they were just charging batteries, leaving batteries on charge, going off having their lunch, leaving them on charge for long periods of time, and then just putting them straight in once they're done, straight into the cars, packing the cars up and going on from there. So we've got three major issues here. One, you've got batteries that have been charged for long, prolonged periods of time, causing hydrogen buildup inside those batteries. You've then got batteries that are being swapped in and out all the time so the energy management system has no idea what batteries in the car how much charge it has there's no historic data for the regeneration system to go okay we need to charge this much it has to do a whole relearning process and then keeping power onto the vehicle unnecessarily not only abuses the charges but it also causes issues with internal energy management systems as well as how the ecus operate if you just suddenly take off power without putting a battery in and you just kill kill ECUs or remove power from ECUs immediately, that can cause issues with ROM, RAM, anything, else, any other programmable devices inside the car. So it, this doesn't explain how we end up with an exploded battery though. So what we what we did was we asked the um, technicians, hey, tell us exactly how your, your, your end of line checks go. What do you do? So they said, okay, well, first thing we do is we get the car in, we roll it in, we go to get the battery that's come off the line. Okay, no problem. And is someone helping you? No, there's only, you know, we're short of staff. There's only one of us. So we use tape and we tape up the bottom of the boot. This little lid that I've got my hand on in the, in the top left, we tape that to the window so that we can work in that general area without being disrupted. No problems. That's fine. Okay. These cars are inside. It's freezing cold outside. So the heating in the building has been wrapped up and is warm. It's, it might as well be. The Bahamas inside these end of line tents is hot. So the air is very dry. And if a, a lot of people here are connecting the dots, you'll know exactly where I'm going with this, but it's very dry air. So it's, it's there's a there's a lot of things going on here. Um, and then the batteries are being pre-charged and they're in a volatile state and they're going straight into cars. They're being connected directly to the ground of the vehicle while the charges are still on at the front, which means that we're getting a direct connection to earth via the front of the vehicle. So all in all, let's talk static electricity. So static electricity, everyone's been on trampolines at one time in their life. Everyone's walked across some very thick carpet. Everyone's touched their car on a very dry day. Um, and we're always told that when you go to fuel up your vehicle, make sure you discharge yourself against the car before you go to touch the vehicle because inherently static electricity is very much capable of generating spark, which is capable of causing explosions in the right, in the right situation. So in this situation, we found out that the, the tape itself is capable of generating 10 to 20,000 volts while it's being pulled off its reel. 
big red flag that that that, that has to go somewhere. And it turns out it was being it was being, it was being brought into the technician, or it was being it was being held on the skin of the technician as he was working. Now, manufacturers do build purpose purpose tape that is ESD proof. But in this situation, they've just gone down to the local dollar store, picked up a whole bunch of reels, because that was the cheapest option, and just started using them on a day-to-day -day basis. So depending on the clothes that was being used, you can also have a capturing or like a capacitive effect of electrostatic um, energy build up on a person. And we just, you know, the new year's just rolled through. We're coming into the middle of the year. Everyone's been given their work gear. What they issue? Nylon, nylon shirts, nylon trousers, nylon socks, nylon hats, whatever it was, it was all nylon, which again is a massive, massive issue because you're going to have a huge buildup of static electricity just from the nylon on the skin alone, let alone from grabbing tape from being inside an environment that's very, very dry without humidity. So you're going to get high static electricity buildup um, and obviously then moving about as well. So we've got a cracked casing here. We've got batteries that are charged perpetually and generating more hydrogen than they often would in a normal situation. So we broke it down to, okay, well, fine. How, how have we had static electricity discharge into a battery to cause the hydrogen to explode? It was only a theory at that point. We couldn't understand how we were getting static electricity through the battery, grounding off through the vehicle, and then blowing up the hydrogen. And it turns out that the Polypropylene is probably uh, propylene is not. Um, it's 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 it doesn't do much in terms of stopping static electricity discharge through a battery. Um, we did a bit of calculations and we said, okay, look, you take the dielectric strength, material thickness, you bring them together, you got to break down voltage. So it's the same sort of same sort of method that's used when it comes to three phase wiring uh, in buildings and high voltage applications to figure. out where there should be an air gap and how far do you need to put in order to stop your um stop any sort of arcing between phase and the same sort of thing happens with dc except with ac you get a sine wave so there is always an off period with dc it's direct current and it is instantaneous application of energy that's sustained until there is no more energy to be given so you're in a you're in a much much more volatile environment here where it's it's more catastrophic events can happen from DC power sources than they can AC. So we went 240 kilovolts as a good baseline between the two numbers there. And we've realized that the material thickness was about 0.3. So we're talking just about three mil-ish. Um, we're talking 7.2 kilovolt potential for breakdown. And we were getting 10 to 20 kilovolts. So sure enough, the spark after this gentleman had gone to go put the battery in, went to go reconnect the negative side of the strap. He himself had arced off through the plastic to the bus bars inside the battery, then from there straight off, but through arcing through the plastic cover into the battery, we actually had the gases ignite, which then blew the top off the battery, hit the gentleman in the face. He then had to be rushed to hospital. So what was the issue here? The issue was there was no electrostatic discharge protection in this tent. It had just been rectified. Bentley was going through a very good sales period. There was a lot of cars moving out of the, out of the manufacturing facility daily, um, and they just hadn't thought to give electrostatic boots, electrostatic couplings for um, wristbands, or running electrostatic floors um, throughout the building because these tents were semi-permanent. Chuck in some heating, put in some ramps, get the cars underway, we've got things to do. So in the end, these sort of things need to be thought about whenever you're working near or around 12 volt batteries, especially with the explosive characteristics of hydrogen being produced while the vehicle, while the batteries are being charged for prolonged periods of time. You go for a long drive, you come home, you stop. If your battery has no ventilation or no ventilation tube and is in the inside environment, the likelihood of having hydrogen be generated inside that battery is very high. And therefore, you should always be careful, um, especially touching your battery in a well-charged state if you happen to have electrical, any sort of electrostatic on you, or any sort of discharge capabilities, it's always better to arc yourself off to the chassis of the vehicle. And from there, then start working on your 12-volt battery. 
So that's the end of my presentation. Um, it's very brief. It's a lot of information all in one shot as well. So please, if you do have any questions, um, do do raise them now. Um, it's good to sort of cover these things and we can give you further information that you may be looking for in regards to 12 volt batteries. But um, I'm always happy to take any further questions via email. Um, I can leave my email in the chat at the end of this. But yeah, thank you very much for your time and thank you for listening to me. Um, I hope you enjoyed. We've uh, Thanks for that, uh, Mark. We've obviously got time for questions. If anyone has a question, um, they can either type it into the chat or alternatively you can uh, unmute yourself, but we don't want everyone talking at the same time. So um, if anyone has a question, let me know. Let us know, please. I think Shane's got a question. Get on. Um, I, I actually do. Um, so with firefighters, uh, they could actually, through their PPE, actually uh, create this sort of charge. And when whilst they're firefighting or looking around a certain mm -hmm. fire scene, actually cause um, that same sort of setup with the battery and cause a fire in itself. Absolutely. It's it's a if you are generating enough stack electricity to bypass the the breakdown volt or the breakdown uh, resistance of that material, then there's a high likelihood that you can cause an explosion with a with a, a well a well hydronized battery or should we say it's a battery that has built up enough hydrogen gas from extended use. However, we're talking about a very specific instant here where these batteries have been charged for a very long period of time and then touched in your vehicle. The likelihood of you sustaining charge, unless you were to charge the way I said that you could charge a battery bulk charging after it had been in a low state of charge, unless you were charging that battery perpetually for hours and hours and hours, generating enough hydrogen to sit inside the battery that isn't being pushed out um, via general road use, then only then would a firefighter be in a situation where they potentially arc off into the battery and cause an explosion. Bear in mind, this also happened because the cars were also on charge, so they were directly earthed by the charger. Now, in the case of a vehicle where there is contact with the ground, unless the boots that the firefighters are wearing aren't ESD rated or if they're not giving correct earthing, then there is a potential that you can arc off into the vehicle. But I don't think there is a, any concern for firefighters in regards to explosive batteries in the back of cars from them touching them during their during their at least their service of a fire. So is there much heat generated with the batteries? Um, like you're talking about um, a generation system where the generator will the um, charger at the front of the vehicle and then the battery at the back, if it's a hundred percent charged, um, the system was actually putting power into it. So was it uh, was there a heat effect as well? Yeah, absolutely. So um, especially when we're taking vehicles to places like Spain and doing in-region testing, what we'd find was 12 volt batteries along with their lithium counterparts were reaching temperatures anywhere between 50 to 60 degrees Celsius. Now, during these times when your battery gets to that heat, a lithium battery will automatically disconnect because a lot of them do have built-in relays and will stop charging to prevent overheating. However, a lead acid battery can potentially reach upwards of 60 to 70 degrees Celsius. At roughly around 80 degrees Celsius, you start boiling the liquid on the inside of the battery. Um, and that obviously becomes a huge issue because you go from potential hydrogen production to a, a boiling liquid. And if you get over boiling, what will happen is that battery will inflate like a basketball and it will, it will end up pretty much rupturing or exploding. So making sure not to put your battery in a high heat scenario, um, though we would never see ambient temperatures of 50 degrees Celsius, as well as perpetual driving or at least leaving a car in a solar load of upwards of 70 degrees Celsius. Um, again, it's very unlikely that you're going to get a battery in a situation that reaches 50 to 60 to 70 degrees Celsius, where as well as being operating and then having something go wrong. It's it's very unlikely, though sure possible if it's a, let's say it's a 40 degree day, you have your car inside a metal shed, so you've got no wind, so you're getting generation of heat, extra heat. And then you start your car and then you start turning on all your electrical loads and you start trying to pull current out of the battery, which then heats internally again. Again, this is a very unique scenario. And if that has happened and the shed doors are closed and you've started your car and you're sitting in it and you're running all your electrical consumers, I think you're more worried about getting carbon monoxide poisoning than your battery actually exploding. The, uh, what about uh, canopies? There's a lot of metal canopies 
that are painted black and people put uh, AGM batteries in the back of them. So that they get up to 60, 70 degrees in the back of a metal canopy. Absolutely. I think the way we looked at it was if the battery's not being used, it's fine to sit at 80 degrees. If yeah. the battery is being charged or discharged under high current at those temperatures, then we're talking about some very dangerous situations there where you are abusing the battery and will potentially cause it to inflate and explode. But if it's not being used and it's simply sitting there, it's okay to get to that temperature. However, I would generally say if it goes time to use that battery, it's worth seeing the battery, letting it cool down, giving a bit of ventilation, and then either charging or discharging the battery. The um, I thought uh, AGM batteries were meant to be airtight and don't have vents. No, no, no. Um, all batteries have vents. Now, when we say tight, we're normally talking about liquid. So in an AGM battery, there's valving. And when the pressure inside the battery builds up to a certain level, the valve expands and allows the gas to escape. So right. though, though, yes, they are a sealed unit and no liquid could feasibly pour out of them, um, there are still abilities or at least valved in certain ways to allow the gas to escape the battery immediately and dump out. Yeah, because I, I modified a vehicle and I put a battery in the boot and they said, yeah, you've got to vent the battery box, obviously. Yeah. For that reason. Um, we've got a question from Andrew Potter on the uh, chat. I, I think I think this, you can answer the question, but it's relating to probably trickle charges. Sure. Yeah, yeah. So um, if you're, if you, so let's talk charges. Um, charges are normally, they're normally rated or they're designed for certain purposes, especially when it comes to outdoor recreational vehicle charges, where they're all solar charges, where there's trickling involved. The battery will sense at voltage a certain point. And then from there, if it senses that the voltage has sustained, so if it's pumped in a whole bunch of current, it's charged up to, let's say, 12.5 volts, it stops charging and it senses the positive and negative to say, okay, well, we're still at 12.5, there's no dip. Bear in mind that when you're charging a battery, you get sags so after you take it off charge, it will drop inherently from a high potential as it drops down to a steady state potential. Um, and it will then stop charging and it will simply pulse current into the battery. Now, if, the, if you put one of these trickle charges on a lithium battery that requires a different charging strategy, is possible if the battery does not have any protections to cause an explosion because the battery is not rated for direct current charging like a lead acid would be. A lithium battery is more of a slow ramp up of current, 1.5, 2 amps, depending on the cell, um, and then sustained and then disconnect and then reapply when it needs to be. No, no bulking, no charge characteristics, no de uh, desulf, uh, excuse me, removing the sulfation of the plates. None of that is done on a, lead, on a lithium battery, that's all lead related. So if you start applying the same charging characteristics to a lithium battery, you can end up overcharging cells or overheating cells to the point of thermal runaway. And we all know when thermal runaway happens, that's it. You, you are at a point where it's a self-sustaining perpetual cycle of fire and explosion. So it's always worth making sure that you, you use the right charges with the right chemistry of the battery. And make sure that there is you not only is the battery in a new and well operated condition, but it's not excessively old where sulfation inside the battery, in this case, lead acids. If there's sulfated plates and sulfation is where the, the plate has dried and there's oxide layer of sulfur on those plates, that then causes a high resistance. If you start charging a high resisted point or start putting current through something that's got high resistance, we all know that we end up with high temperatures which then can lead to fires. So never charge extra old age batteries that you don't know how old they've been, how old they are, or how, how much they've been used. And um, definitely make sure that the charging characteristics your charger are suited for the battery that you are charging. They, they pretty much have some chargers that advertise they can regenerate old batteries. It, it, and it is possible. I myself, through very, very, very mischievous means, have desulfated batteries with other batteries. And all that you're doing there is to shake the sulfation is to instantaneously high current charge and discharge. So you instantaneously high current apply and then take off the current in a, in a pulse cycle um, while also monitoring the post temperature and monitoring internal battery temperature. Um, you can desulfate a battery, sure. Um, a lot of charges state they can do this. I've, I've always been under the belief that if you're going to buy a charge for a battery, buy an expensive one, you only buy it once, you can use it on absolutely everything, it's gonna save you your life, 
and your batteries. Um, but there are definitely chargers there that can do desulfation depending on internal resistance. And the sulfation type is checked by the actual resistance of the internal cells. If the battery has a high resistance, then there's more likely to have um, high sulfation. Yeah. All right, let's I think Eric. Eric. Mm -hmm. I think he's got his hand up, Eric. Hi, Eric. Thanks, guys. Uh, great lecture, Mark. Um, just a, a question around the root cause, that static electricity that uh, ignited the hydrogen. Mm -hmm. Mate, um, can you just explain a little bit further about um, the poly casing? Because mm -hmm. uh, uh, when the worker um, touched the battery, was mm -hmm. there a transfer of static electricity through the poly um, casing to the hydrogen inside, or was it as a result of the hydrogen venting through the um, uh, the venting ports? So, so in this regard, the battery boot had been left open, or the boot of the car had been left open when the battery was. So there was more oxygen to hydrogen ratio than could have been feasible for the battery to explode on the outside. So what happened was, as he had placed the battery down via the handles, he had gone to brace himself out of the car. And as he did so, he touched the surface of the battery and immediately discharged through the actual casing, the three mil casing, onto the bus bar, because that bus bar then is connected to the ground of the vehicle, which is then connected to the chassis, which is then connected to the charger, which was then connected to earth. So he had completed the circuit via the earth of the vehicle all the way back through the charger instead of having the hydrogen that was built up inside the battery expel into the area, the localized area, and then a spark caused that explosion. What had happened was he had actually overcome the breakdown voltage of that polypropylene and had arced through directly through into the actual bus bar. Awesome, mate. Thank you. No problem at all. Is there any other questions, guys? If there's no other questions, I just want to remind the committee we've got our uh, end of year social night next Thursday. Uh, the cost is only $20 and it includes food and drink, so it's an absolute bargain. Uh, for the interstate guys, bad luck, but if you're in town, let us know. Um, so yeah, everyone that wants to come, please sign up on the website. And if there's no other questions or anything else, then uh, we'll close up the meeting and I'd like to thank Mark for. Uh, presenting for us. It was an interesting presentation. Thanks, well, Mark. That was great. Just, everyone, I'm just going to leave my email in the chat. So if you uh, want to email anything over to us or you have any queries or questions or you need anything from Vista Forensics in general, um, we'll be happy to help you. So I'll just chuck that in there now. If anyone wants that, feel free to grab that. Um, if not, I will have my information sent out to everyone uh, via, via Mark. Yeah. And uh, also, yeah, Merry Christmas to everyone. It is December. Uh, our next education night will be February. Um, yeah, so enjoy the holidays. Uh, if you need anything, even if you need uh, Mark's email, you can get it from me. Uh, he's obviously posted it up in the chat. And uh, yeah, have a good holiday season. Thanks, everyone. Try and get to the social night next week. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, See you there. Uh, Thank you very much. Everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. See you guys.